Hey guys and welcome to Spec Transfer and to the second and final part of Transport Across Cell Membranes. So we've just finished covering simple and facilitated diffusion. Next we have osmosis, which is the net movement of water from a region of high water potential to one of lower water potential across a partially permeable membrane. Note that at A level, as opposed to GCSE, we use the term water potential. Water potential is the pressure created by water molecules, so it's measured in a unit of pressure such as pascals. It can be seen as the likelihood of water molecules to move in or out of a solution. Note that pure water potential has a water potential of zero. So because pure water has a water potential of zero, you can never have a water potential greater than zero. Hypotonic means that a solution has a lower water potential to a cell. Hypertonic is the opposite of that, meaning that a solution has a higher water potential to a cell. Isotonic means that they are at the same water potential. Note that water will move by osmosis from a less negative water potential to a more negative water potential. So if the surrounding solution is hypertonic, in animal cells this would result in water entering the cell by osmosis, meaning that the cell may swell and burst, and this is known as lysis. In plant cells, it would result in the cell becoming turgid, which is when the pressure increases to a point where no more water can enter due to the pressure exerted by the cell surface membrane pushing against the cell wall. If the surrounding solution is isotonic, nothing will happen. If the surrounding solution is hypotonic, in animal cells, this would result in the cell crenating, meaning that it shrinks. In plant cells, it would result in the cell becoming plasmalized, which is when the protoplast, which is made up of the cell surface membrane, the nucleus and the vacuole, shrinks from the cell wall. So we need to consider water potential gradient as well, which is basically the same effect as concentration gradient. The steeper the water potential gradient, the faster the rate of osmosis. As osmosis takes place, the difference in water potential on either side of the membrane decreases, so the rate of osmosis levels off over time. Finally, we have active transport. Active transport is the movement of molecules or ions from a region where they are in low concentration to one where their concentration is higher, against a concentration gradient. So this is basically the opposite of diffusion. Active transport requires ATP and carrier proteins. Note that active transport does not involve channel proteins. There are two main differences to facilitate a diffusion. Firstly, it requires ATP from respiration in mitochondria, and secondly, it works against a concentration gradient. It is also selective and specific. So how does active transport actually work? Firstly, a molecule or ion binds to the receptor site on a carrier protein. On the other side of the carrier protein, ATP binds to the protein. ATP is then hydrolyzed into ADP and PI, ADP being adenosine diphosphate and PI an inorganic phosphate ion. And this reaction, remember, is catalyzed by the enzyme ATP hydrolase. The energy released causes the protein to change shape and its other side opens the originally open side closes. Hereby, the molecule or ion is released onto the other side of the membrane. Finally, the phosphate ion is released from the protein, meaning that the protein retains its original shape. The phosphate ion and ADP are then recombined during respiration or photosynthesis to form ATP. Finally, we need to look at co-transport and the spec specifically mentions the absorption of glucose in the ileum. At its best, facilitated passive diffusion will result in an equilibrium. Therefore, not all glucose or amino acids, which are the products of digestion, will be absorbed by facilitated diffusion. We therefore need co-transport, which takes place in the ileum, which is the final part of the small intestine, where the concentration of glucose is too low for it to diffuse into the blood. First of all, Na plus ions are actively transported out of the epithelial cell into the blood via a sodium potassium pump in exchange for potassium ions. This is done by a carrier protein. 
This results in a low concentration of Na plus ions inside the epithelial cell, creating a favorable concentration gradient for the diffusion of Na plus from the lumen. Next, Na plus ions therefore diffuse into the epithelial cell via a sodium glucose co-transporter protein. As it does this, it is coupled with a glucose molecule and takes this into the epithelial cell as well. Therefore, the concentration of glucose inside the epithelial cell increases. Glucose diffuses into the blood down its concentration gradient by facilitated diffusion. Note that co-transporter proteins are types of carrier proteins which bind to two molecules at the same time. The concentration gradient of one, in this case sodium, is used to move the other, which is in this case glucose, against its concentration gradient. So again, just to summarize, while Na plus moves down its concentration gradient, glucose moves against its concentration gradient. However, it is the Na plus gradient rather than ATP directly, which powers the movement of glucose. And therefore, this is known as an indirect form of active transport. Great, so now that we've looked at the various ways in which substances may move across cell membranes, we just have to consider this small part of the specification, which is to acknowledge the various ways in which cells may be adapted for rapid transport, something that is also covered later on when we talk about mass transport, digestion and absorption. So how are cells adapted for rapid transport across their membranes? Well, some may have a large surface area, such as the epithelial cells we just talked about, which have those folds in their cell surface membrane. Some may also have a thin membrane to provide a short diffusion path, and some may have a large number of carrier and channel proteins to increase the rate of facilitated diffusion and active transport. Note that a good blood supply would increase the rate of diffusion by maintaining a favorable concentration gradient, but this is not an adaptation of the cell itself. So always be careful when asked to give adaptations of cells specifically. Great, so that would be all the content we need to know. Thanks guys for watching. Next time we'll be looking at 3.2.4, cell recognition and the immune system.